four of the eight weeks. You get the last four. Before I jump into that, I, I just have a statement that I want to make. Uh, it, it really, it opens a whole can of worms, and it's really a series in itself, but I'm, I want to do this in five minutes, and I'm going to give complete credit to a young pastor by the name of Josh Howerton. Uh, I was thinking about writing this this week, and I got this through social media, and I said, this cannot be improved upon, so I want you to hear this. Seven things Christians should believe about Israel versus Palestine. Number one, all people are created in the image of God and loved by God, for God so loved the world, John 3.16. Number two, Christians have a special affection for Israel. Why? Because God specially made them a people, gave us the scriptures through them, brought us our Savior through them, and the only reason we are saved is because we have been grafted into the promises of God that were originally given to them. Number three, all who believe in Jesus are called in Scripture the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16, and are grafted in as God's chosen people. These are people, or there are people of God, Christians, in both Palestine and Israel. I have Palestinian Christian friends who've endured oppression and persecution. Number four, some have tried to frame a Hamas versus Israel conflict as left versus right. It is not. It is, in general terms, good versus evil. The word Hamas is the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, when God brought judgment upon the earth because of all of the wickedness, everybody say wickedness, other translations say violence, everybody say violence, it's the Hebrew word Hamas. Now think about the terror and the violence and the wickedness that has been spread through this terrorist organization. Number five, Hamas is an evil terrorist organization and there is no context that justifies what they have done in Israel. We should pray that Hamas is brought to justice and the sinful demonic ideology beneath Hamas is fully eradicated from the world. Palestine is not the problem, it's Hamas. Hamas needs to be dealt with in Palestine. Y'all hearing me this morning? Evil will never stop itself. It must be stopped. Therefore, it is appropriate for Christians to support what has been called throughout church history a just war articulated by St. Augustine. While individual Christians are forbidden to live by the sword or seek vengeance, Romans 12, 9, governments are commanded by the Bible to bear the sword and to seek justice. Number seven, and I'm finished. There are people created in God's image in Palestine and Israel that are suffering and will suffer, and our hearts should break for all of them. For the innocents, for the children, Israel has a right to defend herself. And don't trust everything that's coming out of the media. Are you hearing me? So we should pray for the peace of God and for the families that are broken, Israelite or Israeli families and Palestinian families who've lost children, who've lost loved ones, who've lost brothers and sisters, grandparents, moms and dads, aunts and uncles, cousins, all of the, all the family relationships that have been fect, affected by that on both sides in Israel and in Gaza. I just pray, and this is where my concern is, is this doesn't escalate into a whole regional conflict between other nations, and then it becomes another world conflict. It very easily could do that. Pause with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we long for the day when you will return. Eradicate all evil, wipe every tear from every eye, and make all things new again. Our hearts burst at the thought of worshiping around your glorious throne with redeemed people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, Israel and Palestine. Until then, we groan for that day on days like today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Conflict began with Abraham, who is the father of three faiths. 
not only the Jewish faith, but then the Christian faith sprang from that, and then later the Islamic faith in the 6th century through the prophet Muhammad. They all claim connection to Abraham. Um, that's as far as I'm going to go this morning. I would love to make some more comments on some other issues. And uh, I, I just I, I don't want to open up that can of worms right now. So I want to be able to stay with where we're flowing. My focus right now is just to bring your attention to prayer. Pray for the peace of Israel. Pray for the peace of Palestine. And pray for God to bring down the terrorist organization called Hamas. Would you do that if you would say amen? All right. This morning as we... As we jump in, I, I, I got to lose this. It was, you know, these days right now, as you start out with a sweater or a coat in the morning, and by the afternoon, you're like, I got to go put my shorts on, you know? Um, and so, <sighs> starting to sweat. This is the fourth message in this series called Emotionally Spiritual, I'm sorry, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I've titled it today, Don't Stall at the Wall. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 through 12. And the New Living Translation say it this way. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We're confident that you are meant for better things. Everybody say better things. God intends better things for you, for us, for the people of God. We're confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. King James says things that accompany salvation. For God is not unjust... He will not forget how hard you have worked for Him and how you have shown your love to Him by caring for other believers as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Last verse. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead... You will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. King James says that you would be followers, be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So faith is a necessary element, but patience. Everybody say patience. That thing that we sometimes say I don't have enough of but sure don't want to pray for. It's the Greek word hupomone. Hupomone. It almost, you know, you almost feel like you're going to a Greek wedding and you say, hupomone. Hupomone means to abide under. It means to remain under the weight or the pressure of the load that you're carrying. Hupomone is a life word for me, a Bible word. Hupomone. It hupo means under, for example, if we translate hupo to English, it's hypo, like a hypodermic needle goes under the dermis, under your skin. It's, it's the opposite of hyper. In Greek, it's hooper. Okay, so very close, closely related. So hupo is to, to go under. Hupomone, mone means to abide or dwell. For example, in my father's house are many mansions, is the old English word. And I don't believe that's a 40-room mansion because uh, it, it just literally is translated dwelling places. God's, God's house has many dwelling places, resting places. And so when we hoopamone, when we endure, it means that I've got a load and I'm not shirking it. I'm not going apostate and leaving my post. I'm not shirking my responsibility, but I'm holding up under the load. Through faith and endurance, through faith and patience, through faith and hoopamone. The one thing is long today, so I'm not going to ask you to read it, and I'm going to abbreviate it as I move through the message. I use this little tool to basically underline a couple of things that I want you to get if you don't get anything else. The Christian life is a journey. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. amen. 
It's not just a destination. It's not just a home in heaven. It is a journey. It is learning to walk with Jesus. It is not just to be saved by Jesus from the fire of hell or to a home in heaven, but it's learning to walk, to follow Jesus. The Christian life is a journey with seasons of growth and change, experiencing both victory and defeat. In the dark night of the soul, we hit a wall. Everybody say a wall. We hit a wall that will reveal God's heart and will transform our lives if we keep trusting Him. Don't stall at the wall. So the only thing I want you to say is the last sentence. Say it. Don't stall at the wall. One more time. Don't stall at the wall. You know, life and Christianity sometimes in the American version, the last 50 years, especially the last 20 has been painted to just be sort of come to Jesus and it's just all a bed of roses. It's just a glorious mountaintop experience. And yes, there are roses to smell and there are mountaintops to celebrate their triumphs, but they're also tragedies. It does not take a lot of faith to stand on the mountain of victory and give God praise. When it takes faith is when you descend that mountain down into the valley where there's a demon-possessed man in the valley of Gadarenes. It takes faith to trust in God when you're walking through the dark place that David called the valley of the shadow of death where he said, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff they comfort me. That's where our faith is tested and tried. That's where we find out what we're made of. Every believer at some point will experience his dark night of the soul. That is a phrase that is taken from uh, St. John of the Cross, a contemplative writer, centuries ago. And every saint, if you walk with the Lord long enough, unless you're a brand new believer, at some point in your journey, uh, and I've experienced this, it's not just one time and say, okay, I got that behind me. I've hit the wall and I've broken through. But several times, at least twice in my life, and I'm not talking about the little daily trials and tribulations. I'm talking about where you're just tooling right along and you're, you're just you're wa walking with God. You've got the joy of the Lord and you're just trusting God in faith and prayers are getting answered and then bam, you hit a wall. You're in circumstances that you can't explain. Nothing feels right. Everything has changed. You wonder if God is even still looking at you with any kind of favor whatsoever. Your prayers don't much less get above the ceiling. They don't get above your nose. And you feel like, God, where in the world are you? And what, how, what are you doing to me? Don't stall at the wall. Let's look at your neighbor and say, don't stall at the wall. Pray with me. Father, help me today in Jesus' name. Thank you for clarity. Thank you for brevity. Thank you for understanding in the hearts and the minds of the people of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. don't stall at the wall. Point number one, there are seasons to our spiritual lives. If we grow, by definition of growth, there has to be change. Change sometimes is painful. Sometimes we don't change until it becomes harder to stay the same than it is to make the change. And I want you to recognize that God is all about maturing us. Far too long, the American evangelical church has been more concerned about going up than they've been about growing up. And it, it's time. It, we, we, we've got to recognize that we've got some things to do. We have some responsibilities in this world and the greatest thing you can do right now in the middle of when folk are predicting that the end of the world is tomorrow and the end of the world is coming and I've lived through so many of those predictions it's embarrassing and I want to just tell you right now we will live through this one again and we will live to wake up for another day somebody say amen, amen. Jesus is going to come back I believe that but when somebody starts telling you that the day and the hour it clearly is contradictory to what Jesus said himself no man knows the day not the angels not even the son of man but only the father in heaven you start playing with stuff only the father knows you're gonna jack some stuff up in your life seasons of spiritual life uh, there are several of those. Not the first one is the season where we become aware of God. Where God sets up circumstances and He's drawing us 
out of our contentment into a place of divine discontentment. And he begins to stir something in the way of vision and uh, a hungering for a sense of purpose and recognizing that I was born for a reason and, and it's more than what I'm experiencing right now. And sometimes it's a place of brokenness. It's a place of addiction that God has to move in and help us to break. And it's in those times of need. It's when we recognize that we need a Savior, that we call on the Lord. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. And so it's in the, 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 our opening season with God and walking with Him on this journey is an awareness of God where we recognize our need. And you cross that line of faith and you say, Jesus, transform my life. And, and something changes on the inside. And uh, you got a newborn feeling dwelling in your heart today as my mama used to sing when I was growing up. And you get in the Word. You get in a Bible study. You, you start to enter the second season of your spiritual journey and it's called discipleship. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. God didn't call us to make believers. He didn't call us to make Baptists or Pentecostals or Protestants or Catholics. He didn't say go into all the world and make Christians. He said go into all the world and make disciples. So we're about making disciples. We're, I'm a teaching pastor. We're a teaching lead team. It's not just about a few minutes of a shout or a feel good. And I love to shout and I love a good feel. But I want to make sure that I put some substance in you so that when the feeling's gone, you've got the tools and the principles to be able to land on your feet on Monday morning when you go in there where you think the boss doesn't like you and you can have the right attitude in the mind of Christ in the middle of those circumstances. Somebody say amen. amen. Awareness of God is number one. Discipleship is number two. And then we start to grow and we begin to actively participate in the advancement of the kingdom of God at our local church and in our community. It's not all about the bricks and mortar here at this place, but it's about being the light in the middle of the darkness that it's out there. It's not being churchy and religious in the face of folks. It's, it's about being the love of Jesus in their presence. That's what people need. Come on, somebody. They need to see folk that will actually live it and walk it and talk it. Micah 6, 8 says, What did the Lord require of you, O man? He says, To do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. A people that will walk in integrity with ethics, who will do justly and who will love mercy and be willing to forgive and not, and not pick up a bag of rocks every time you see somebody not doing something right. But go to them and, 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 and share with them the love of God and share the need to repent and turn and then to walk humbly with God. Not get proud of yourself because that's not your problem. You know, many times when we want to get churchy and judge other folks, it's always about something that we're not struggling with. But we, oh, now, you know, don't, but don't talk about my stuff. Because, you know, let me tell you, I, uh, this is what we do. And I'm going to put it in first person. I'm not saying you, but I'll say this is me. This is what we do as humans. This is what I do. I judge you by your actions. I judge me by my intentions. See, I put it first place so you, nobody thinks I'm like hunting for bear in the room or anything. I, I'm not after anybody. And after our awareness of God and our discipleship and our growth and our active serving, somewhere along the way we're just tooling right along and we smack the wall. And the wall is a place of frustration. The wall is a place of total discontentment. The wall is a place of God for a season removing His manifest presence. Now He never leaves us nor forsakes us, I know that. Uh, Jeremiah talks about the, 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 the time of Jacob's trouble. Pastor Haley preached on that two weeks ago out of Genesis 32 where Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the angel made him say his name because he had to recognize who he was. And once he recognized his identity, he said, but that's not who you're going to remain to be. I now give you a new name because I'm going to make you a prince, a prevailer with God. Your name's no longer Jacob, but it's Israel. And you got to wrestle through that identity crisis. There's a time of trouble that we walk through. There's a time of trouble that defines us. Because in those moments, what did we say? We said that every believer at some point will experience his or her dark night of the soul where he or she hits the wall. And, and when we do that, we recognize 
that in that moment that we can't stall at the wall, if we will lean into God's heart, He will open His heart to us in new ways we've never imagined before. He will transform our lives if we keep trusting Him. Tell your neighbor, don't stall at the wall. And so we walk through, and this is not just an event. It's not just a long weekend. Sometimes the wall is a whole season in your life. Sometimes the wall can be months. God forbid, sometimes the wall can be years. I walked through a wall in my life that lasted for years. The wall pushes me inward where I begin to really examine from the inside who I am and I start getting real and honest with myself and I wrestle with that messenger of God in Genesis 32 and I say, I'm not quitting, I'm not going to let go until you show up and show out in my life. The journey inward pushes me in and it makes me come smack in, in front of and face to face with who I truly am in reality. But God doesn't leave me in the journey inward. God will start to turn me outward as transformation begins to take place. And then finally, number six, as, I'm, as I begin to journey outward, God shows me now from a new place, a new understanding, a new revelation that I'm called to live out of that love that God's now deeply worked into my heart. Christian life is a journey with seasons of growth. We'll all hit a wall where it, which will reveal God's heart and transform our lives if we keep trusting Him. Don't stall at the wall. Point number two, getting through the wall. How do we get through the wall? Abraham is a, an example of one who walked with God. He's, he, he was worshiping the moon in Ur of the Chaldees. The last few verses of the 11th chapter of Genesis uh, Abraham, Abram, whether it's his name at the time, he's not seeking God. God comes seeking him, which is really the true order. We, we, we don't seek after God, never at any point, until God begins to draw us by his spirit, and then that's when the awareness of God opens up into our lives. We recognize we need him. God tapped Abram on the shoulder, and he says in Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, he says those five promises that we preached in the last series on uh, blessed on principles of prosperity where he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. I'm going to make your name great. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Five different blessings God promised to Abram. Now, this is a guy who is already at this point 75 years old. His wife, Sarai, is 65. She's 10 years his junior. Both of them at that point are beyond age-bearing, I mean, I'm sorry, beyond child-bearing years. And yet God, in the journey, tells Abram, he says him right there at that point, he says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Now, I don't know how you think, figure that's going to happen, uh, because he's 75 and she's 65. And, you know, there won't no little blue pills yet. I'll, I'll just quit right there. <laughs> Leave it alone. How many know we keep it real at Victory? And he said to Abram, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And his name, Abram, means exalted father. And so when he changed his name in Genesis 15, Abraham goes down to the local, local drinking hole and he's hanging out with his buddies and he says, guys, quit calling me Abram. God showed up and he's changed my name to Abraham. And they laugh out loud because Abraham to their tongue means father of many nations. And they said, whoa, Abe, how old are you, dude? At this point, he's probably 78, 79, 80 years old. Sarah has increased, respectively, at the same, along with him. Oh, oh, well, how, how you figure that's going to happen? And, you know, as boys will be boys and gentlemen will be gentlemen when they're together and they're kidding him. And, you know, how, how you figure that's going to happen? They're just razzing him. They're just cutting into him uh, like, like nobody's business. And from the time God made Abram a promise that he was going to be a daddy to the nations until his actual promised son showed up, it was 25 years. 25 years. I don't have time to tell the story. There's, it's so rich from Genesis 12 all the way to about 21. 
when Isaac is born and he's weaned and they throw a feast. Between that time, probably let's say 10, 15 years into it, they keep getting older and older and older. And actually Sarah comes up with an idea. Hey, I've got this handmaid. Her name is Hagar. Why don't you take her and see if maybe... Mm, got that loving feeling. And you see if maybe... And so he said, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> it's in the Bible, people. <laughs> he said, okay. And so just, just, let's just do the Reader's Digest condensed version and clean it all up. And he goes, and it takes, and... Hagar comes out, and about three months she's showing, and Abraham is strutting around the camp. I still got the goods. I ain't lost my mojo. I still got the goods. And you know what? He was able to, in a moment of inspiration, yeah, huh? was able to father a child through an Egyptian bondmaid, but he didn't know that he was about to start an internal conflict and tension and a war that was going to go on for thousands of years between the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Isaac. I wish I could stop and teach the history on this because it's fascinating. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons, which became the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. But so did Ishmael have 12 sons, and they had 12 tribes, and those became all of the Arab nations. And when Islam comes along, they actually rewrite Genesis 12 through 21, and they make Ishmael the promised son, and Isaac the illegitimate child. So they twist it around. And from that point on, there is tension, especially when God changes Abram to Abraham. Ha. Everybody say ha. God added a ha to Abram's name. And Sarai, he changes that. It's S-A-R-A-I in English, but he changes it to Sarah, A-H. So he adds an ah to Sarah's name and a ha to Abraham. Everybody say ah ha. Ah. And guess what? When ah and ha got together in faith, here comes a baby named Laughter. Everybody say, aha, aha, aha. Say it. I say, aha. So God took Sarah's ah and Abraham's ha, and he made a new baby that was the promised seed. And guess what? Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And it, there came a time when Sarah said, you must cast out the bondwoman and her son because Ishmael was making fun of and taunting the promised seed. And from that point on, there's been irreconcilable tension. 25 years. And in that 25 years, at some point, Abraham listened because his wife decided, hey, it's not going to happen with us. It's probably not going to happen with me. Go see what you can do with Hagar. And then when the baby, she got pregnant, Sarah was ticked off about it. And I, I don't, I'm going to just leave that alone right there. But it was your idea. I don't care. Get her out of here. I don't have time. I'd love to open up the life of David, but think about this. He's a 15-year-old who marches into battle, and he's got courage, and he's, got, he's fearless in the face of a giant. The Israel armies literally are, are trembling. Their knees are knocking together, and you've got a young man who knew the presence of God on the side of a hill by praising God, and God's presence would show up, and he would, he would protect the sheep of his daddy's house, and he got skilled with a slingshot. And he, he once rescued the whole flock from the, the paw of a, a lion and the jaw of a bear. And because, because of that, he said, God who, who, who helped me to save the sheep from the lion and the bear will this day take the head off of this giant. And he killed the giant. And Saul, who was the king of Israel, said, I must have this young man in my court. And he found out that David was a talented musician and Saul had been troubled by the Lord with an evil spirit because he disobeyed God and David would play the instrument, he would play the harp and he would sing the psalms that he'd written out in the valley on the mountaintop leading and shepherding the sheep and he would do that, the, 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 the troubling spirit, the anxiety, the worry, the stress, the fretting that was happening in the king's heart would ease and Saul would go to sleep. 
David continued to grow, and you know the story, and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out so much here, but literally because of the testimony of the favor of God on his life, Saul didn't know it, but God had gotten disgusted with Saul, and he'd called Samuel, and he says, I'm, I'm washing my hands of Saul. I have a new king that I intend to put on the throne at some point, and Saul didn't even know that David had had the the horn of oil poured over his head and he was anointed as the future king of Israel but it would be 13 years from the time he was anointed until the time that he took the throne and in that period of time mad king demonically possessed angry king Saul every chance he got would try to pin David's carcass to the wall with a javelin can you imagine a king that you love a king that you served a king that you have laid your life on the line and taken out giants and killed Philistines so that the people of God could live in peace. And the women of Israel bring their tambourines and they're saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And Saul goes, wait a minute. I don't, I don't like that social media post. Who put that up on Instagram? What do you mean Saul his thousands and David his ten thousands? Well, they're going to keep singing this and they're going to make him king. Well, he did, little did he know that God was going to make him king. Thirteen years, David wandered through the wilderness of Canaan, through Israel, running in and out of caves, in and out of the wilderness, in the desert, in, in, in places of, of abject poverty, in, in places of dire danger, in places of hunger and thirst. And yet in all those places, God met him in a great way. He was in the back of a cave one night in the darkness, and he said in Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light. I mean, you know when you're in the dark, that's what you need, some light. The Lord, looking around and can't see a thing. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David met the Lord. You know what David learned in those 13 years? He learned how not to be a king. So that when he got to the throne, he could be a better king. So God led David and he hit a wall that was 13 years long. Seven years ago this week, <clears throat> Thursday, October 19th, I got up on it was a Wednesday morning that week and I overslept. Someone was banging at the door and they'd seen Dawn laying in the backyard and she called out to her as the neighbor. She said, I can't wake her up. And I jumped up and grabbed my cargo shorts and ran out with that shirtless and barefooted. Ran into the backyard and I found the love of my life, 31 years. <clears throat> Laying on the ground dead with a gunshot in her head. And we'd hit the wall about four years before that. She was going through menopause. She was wrestling with empty nest syndrome because Drew had moved to Dallas for a new job. Abby was in her second year at Belmont studying commercial voice. She wasn't coming home every weekend that second year. In October, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And all of that was just like a perfect storm that just sat down. And she began to have some fears and some paranoia that I think were related to her hormonal imbalance in menopause. And concocted the most outrageous, outlandish ideas. And I was, you talk about a, between a rock and a hard place because it involved two women in this church and two teachers at school and another two women in the community. She had in her head that these six had colluded together to destroy her and we're going to take the church away from me and we're going to put her in jail and take us out of our house. It was just pure nonsense. It was crazy. It was, and, and we fought and we argued. And I'm wrestling with, okay, I'm trying to go, okay, is there some truth here, some fragment of truth? And it created tension in our team. And I'm, I'm, I'm walking around with a hairy eyeball all the time looking at everybody, making me paranoid. And I'm crying out to God, going, God, what are you, you know, please answer, help us. And I said, you got to get some help. And so she started seeing a therapist, and they put her on medication. And we were praying. We were doing everything we knew, spirit, soul, and body, trying to cover the whole man, the whole person. And we prayed. 
and there seemed to be a season where it got better and then it turned and got way worse I had a prostatectomy I don't mind telling you it was in end of November and all of this was just so much weight that I couldn't even talk about number one just from the, the stigma of that kind of mental illness a lot of it I didn't even learn about until the last year of, of paranoid personality disorder and really where she was diagnosed the day before she killed herself was she was diagnosed delusional which was the next thing is paranoid schizophrenic in the line in the spectrum and I felt like we turned a corner I thought we were going to get some help I, I didn't know if she was going to be committed or what her medical doctor changed her prescription that day and little did I know that that change in her prescription would embolden, embolden her to do what she had been fighting not to do, but had been wrestling with the idea. In the middle of all of that, I'm crying out to God on a daily basis. And I'm going to tell you a quick story because this is one way I know that God was still hearing me. I felt like my prayers were not going above the ceiling. And I'm grateful that, I've, that it's been seven years and I can tell this story without literally breaking down right here in front of you. It took me three, four years to where I could even talk about it and not break down every time. I've hit the wall a couple of times in my walk with God, but this is by far the greatest wall that I've ever experienced in my life. And I remember I, before she took her life, we were watching American Idol, and it was the 15th season. And I saw one evening young Clark Beckham playing, who's a Holy Ghost church boy, He's, they've got two grand pianos, and he's sitting right beside Michael McDonald on another grand piano, and he's singing, and it's amazing. And I mean, the hair stood up on my arm. Dawn's there. We're watching, and we're loving this. And I'm just literally, I'm, I, the anointing, the Holy Spirit of God has just grabbed me in watching him on American Idol. And the next morning, I sat out back behind the courtyard fence that I built when we first moved in the house when Abby's a little bitty baby girl. And I wrote in my journal, I said, Father... I, I do not know if you're even hearing me in this place. I've never told this before. I do not know if you even hear me. I don't know if, if your favor is lifted off of my life or what. But I ask you, show me something. Show me that you hear my prayers in this struggle with Dawn. And I said, that boy that was on American Idol last night, I want him and Abby to do some music together. And I ask you in the name of Jesus that if you hear in my prayers, you show me this sign and you let Clark call Abby and ask to do a song with her. And do you guys know that before the week was over with, it wasn't five days, Abby called me and she said, guy, Dad, this guy named Clark Beckham who was just on American Idol just called me. Y'all hear me? You, you can go on YouTube and you can search Yeba and Clark Beckham and Gravity. They did a cover of John Mayer's Gravity. And I mean, they churched it up. It was, it was pretty awesome. And th when that happened, I was like, okay, okay, you're still hearing me. You haven't left me. You haven't forsaken me. How many, does anybody know what I'm talking about where you've been in a place and you go, God, I don't, are you even there? Are, 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 can you hear me? Am I, am I, is there a block somewhere? God, have you put me on mute? Have you blocked me? Have you blocked me where I can't even send you a text by the Spirit? Are, are, you, are you getting any of my messages? And when that came through, I knew that God had heard me. Three, four days after dawn passed, and we're just in the throes of all of it. I'm standing in my backyard late one night, and I stuck my fist in the air in one moment I said damn you for doing this to me and the next moment I broke and I said God please you've, you've got me on the operating table and I pray that as you have me open wide open that you work and you fix me God do, do a work in me oh God that when I come out of this that I can love with a deeper love than I've ever loved before and I want to I want to tell you, in that experience, I learned something. I, I, I have a, my heart, there's an empathy. There's a hurting with people when they're struggling. It's not a judgment because, well, you made the decision and got yourself in the mess you're in. How many of the church can do that to you? And it's a compassion and it's an empathy and it's, it's a something that I can't explain, that I know that God worked on the inside of me. 
I, don't, I can't even preach a funeral anymore without crying at the funeral because I know how people are hurting. Yes. And, I, and I know that if, if folk will lean into Jesus, I'm going to tell you that old gospel song said, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, tell me where would I be? Life on the other side. Are you getting anything out of this this morning? Let me finish quickly. There's so much in this, and as you get in your groups this week, you'll talk about when you come through the wall, and I just, I'm not even going to comment. I'm just going to share them. There's a greater level of brokenness. There's a brokenness in my life now Amen. that I have actually come to be grateful for. Number two, there's a greater appreciation for holy unknowing. I used to be the guy who had all the answers. I don't even kid myself to think that anymore. Because I don't know why. And that's why... My children struggle so. That's why my baby girl was so angry at God for four years. Because she was traveling with Beth Moore singing, traveling with Priscilla Shirer. She fasted three days in her apartment in Nashville and marched around her apartment confessing healing scriptures over her mama. And then her mama shot herself. And Abby is going, she's basically flipping God off at it. I didn't do it that time, okay? <laughs> I mean, really, just, and some of you are a little offended that I even said it that way. How many of you know the last thing you need to do is pretend your anger toward God? You need to say it. Get it out. Oh, how dare you? Well, how many of you know he already knows you? You harboring all that nonsense. And if you can get it out, I mean, I mean, even if you're in a cuss, it can become a prayer where you're going, God, i got to have your help. you got to show up in my life. Number three, a deeper ability to wait on God. My goodness, wouldn't life be better in the Middle East and the whole world if Abraham had waited for the promised son instead of taking a good idea? Well, God, since you're not going to do it, I'm going to see if I can't do it in my own strength. How many of you know it's always going to get you in trouble? Because Ishmael's going to grow up and you've got to feed that baby. Five essential truths and I'm finished. I just, I just want to say this to you. There's nothing, there's nothing lovely about these five things. They're hard. Number one, life is hard. If you don't think that, then you're probably about two years old. Or maybe a little bit older and you've got mamas and daddies that take care of you and every need that you, you have is met and... And, you know, new clothes and new shoes and school and house and home and, and car to ride in and food on your table. But you grow up a little bit in life, and life is hard. Life is hard. Life, you want to know if life is hard? Ask, ask the people who've lost children in Israel. Ask the people who've lost sons and daughters in Palestine. Number two, I am not that important. I am not that important until I can get delivered from the idea that the sun and the solar system and all the stars all revolve around me, then I can't get myself into an emotionally healthy place where I can stay and remain a productive member of my church family, of my neighborhood, of my school, of my society, the, the, co the community that I live in. I am not that important. Number three, my life is not about me. It's something greater. It's, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for a reason. This short, three score and ten, 70 years, or if by reason of strength, four score, 80 years. If I can live that with a sense of purpose, if I can live that with forgiveness and with love of God in my heart for all people, then I will have accomplished something magnificent, something great. Number four, oh my goodness, I am not in control. My daddy used to say this. He'd say to mom and Aunt Lucille, when they'd just be sitting together and worrying and just fretting and bickering and did you mean anything about this or that? And he, he said, I don't even know what y'all want to even talk about that for. You can't do anything to change it. And he would say, you know what I learned a long time ago? If I, can't, if I can't do anything directly to change it, I'm not going to waste my time worrying about it. Right. 
I am not in control. You know what? Guess what? There is a God and you are not Him. I am not Him. Number five. Some of you might think this is a little bit dark, but this is reality. I am going to die. I'm going to die. He's numbered my days. I don't want to think about it. At the same time, I'm ready. I mean, there are moments I, I, don't, I don't look back with nostalgia. I still look forward with hope. There was a season where I didn't have a whole lot of it. But I still look forward with hope. I really honestly believe that my best days are still yet ahead of me. I believe God has great things planned for everyone in this room. But you must realize this was something that the, the soldiers from ancient battles re reminded themselves of. People get it tattooed on themselves these days. Memento mori. Remember we die. And that awareness of that helps us to live with something larger than just our short breath of life. It helps us to live with an eternal perspective that God chose in this moment, in this season to make me aware of himself and to touch my life with his presence and cause me to be born from above, to be a child of God, a new creation, bought by the blood, filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit of God. But even with all of that, I am going to die. That's just a reality. If Jesus does not come before the end of my life, I will see him when I close my eyes in this realm and open them in the next age. Yeah. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, I'm finished. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now. There's that word, it's like a double hoopamone. Patient endurance is what you need now. So that, everybody say so that. So that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that He has promised. I'm still leaning into the promises of God. Sometimes they don't come the way I thought they would come. But He's still God. He's still a good God all the time. He is able. And I will never put on you because of what I've been through to say, oh, well, you know, make excuses or try to pull your faith down. No, there's something in me that still has hope. There's something in me that's all about cheering you on in your faith. If I could do, go back and do it over again, I would certainly take a different look because none of us saw it coming in my wall in what we went through. It was about three years prior to her dying, and then it took me about three years after. So that wall I went through was about six years coming through. And I'm thankful for a loving congregation that prayed for me, that called me, that checked on me, that brought food by, not just the week of her death, but, but just occasionally going, Pastor, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you. I had people call me this week because they knew that it was the anniversary of her death. And I thank you. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. This morning in this room, as we, as we close this message, and I know it's just been a little bit long, but I just want to say this to you. There are people that are in this room right now who are in the place I'm talking about. It may not be a mental illness. It may not be suicidal tendencies. But it can be financial. It can be a relationship. It can be any number of things. I don't have to stop and give examples. You know what your wall is if you hit a wall. And what I want to tell you is, is that in that place, if you will lean in and not quit, if you'll keep trusting, if you will stay confident in God's ability, if you will keep the switch of faith turned on, the King James says, then great is your recompense of reward. There will be a great reward, and it will be through your patient endurance God will give to you what He has promised. Don't quit. Three things my family taught me. Trust God, work hard, never quit. Everybody say, never quit. You know what? Even what we want to label as a failure is not a failure in God if you don't quit. 
If you learn the lesson from it, then you come out stronger and better and equipped than you more than you were before. If you don't quit. Because now that you're in Christ, you're forgiven. And if you don't quit, guess what? God just says, well, we're not going to end this ball game at 9 and 8. We're going to run this thing until you win, until the score says you've won, until you've got victory over this thing, until you break through that wall. Hallelujah. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to pray with you this morning. If anybody feels like this message has been for you and you're at a wall right now, no one looking around. Would you slip up your hand? I want to pray for you. Yes, there's half a dozen people's hands went up around the room. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for these circumstances. You know, Lord, the interpersonal issues, the intricacies of the confusion and the worry and the doubt and the fear and the, Lord, everything that needs to take place in each of these lives. God, I thank you that as we look to you and we say, God, I trust you. Lead them through, Lord. Break through these walls. Lord, these walls of financial provision, these walls of relationship confusion, Lord, these walls of mental struggle, Lord, these walls of, of, of physical and chemical addiction. In Jesus' name, I thank you that you bring change and you transform and you reveal your heart, oh God, in the middle of the wall. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and all of God's people said, amen. We're going to stand to our feet this morning. And I want to ask you this. Those of you in this room who you have experienced what I'm talking about and you would say, Pastor, I'm grateful because I saw God actually break through and crumble the wall in front of me. And, and if, if you've got that testimony, I'd like for you, if you're willing to, Anybody that would say, Pastor, I've been there and God has brought me through this kind of an experience and I want to pour into somebody else. I want to pray for somebody else. If that's you, I'd like for you to come up here and be ready to pray for the others that are going to come. Now, those of you who raised your hands, if you're comfortable with it, no pressure. But if you're comfortable with it, I'd like for you to come. As all of our prayer leaders, our prayer warriors, would you please come and get across the front here. And there are those in this room who would come and say, please pray for me. I've hit a wall. So this morning as we lead this song of worship, this, this song of God's ability to move and, and crack open Egypt and bring deliverance, I ask you in the name of Jesus if you would come and let's pray together in Jesus' name.